one dollar and eighty-seven cents. That was all, and sixty cents of it was in pennies. Penny saved one and two at a time by bulldozing the grocer and the grouched old man and the butcher until one's cheeks burned with the silent deputation of parsimony that such close dealing implied. Three times Della counted it. And the next day would be Christmas. There was clearly nothing to do but flop on the shabby little couch and howl, so 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 Della did it. Howl, Which sob, instigates sob, an oral howl, reflection howl, that life sob, is made up of sobs, sob, sniffles, sob, and smiles, howl, with sniffles oh. predominating. <laughs> While the mistress of the home is gradually subsiding from the first stage to the second, take a look at the home. A furnished flat at eight dollars per week. It did not exactly beggar description, but it certainly had that word on the lookout. In the vestibule below was a letter box into which no letter would go, and an electronic button from which no mortal finger could coax a ring. Also appertaining thereunto was a card bearing the name Mr. James Dillingham Young. The Dillingham was flung to the breeze during a former period of prosperity when its possessor was being paid $30 a week. Now, when the income has shrunk to $20, the letters of Dillingham look blurred, as though they were thinking seriously of contracting to a modest and unassuming D. But whenever Mr. James Dillingham Young came home and reached his flat above, he was called Jim, and greatly hugged by Miss James Dillingham Young, already introduced to you as Della which is all very good. Della finished her cry and attended to her cheeks with the powder rag. Tomorrow was Christmas, and I only have one dollar and eighty-seven cents to buy Jim a present. She had been saving every penny she could for months with this result. Expenses had been greater than she had calculated. They always were. Only a dollar eighty-seven for Jim. There was a pier glass between the windows of the room, perhaps you've seen a pier glass in an eight dollar flat. A very thin, very agile person may, by observing his reflection in a rapid sea, Della, being slender, had mastered the art. Suddenly she whirled from the window and stood before the glass. Her eyes were shining brightly, but her face had lost its color within twenty seconds. Rapidly she pulled down her hair and let it fall to its full length. Now, there were two possessions of the James Sillingham Youngs in which they both took a mighty pride. One was James Gold Watch that had been his father's and his grandfather's. The other was Della's hair. Had the Queen of Sheba lived in the flat across the air shaft, Della would have let her hair hang out the window some day just to, to dry, just to depreciate Her Majesty's jewels and gifts. Had King Solomon been the janitor, with all his treasures piled up in the basement, Jim would have pulled out his watch every time he passed, just to see him pluck his beard from envy. So now Della's beautiful hair fell about her, rippling and shining like a cascade of brown waters. It reached below her, me her knee and made itself almost a garment for her. And then she did it up again nervously and quickly. With a world of skirts and a brilliant sparkle in her eyes, she fluttered out the door and down the stairs to the street. Will you buy my hair? I buy hair. Take your hat off and let's have a sight at the looks of it. Twenty dollars. Give it to me quick. Oh, and the next two hours tripped by on rosy wings. Forget the hash metaphor. She was ransacking the stores for Jim's present. She found it at last. It surely had been made for Jim and no one else. There was no other like it in any of the stores, and she had turned all of them inside out. There was a platinum fob chain, simple and chest in design, properly proclaiming its value by substance alone and not by ornamentation, as all good things should do. It was even worthy of the watch. As soon as she saw it, she knew that it must be Jim's. It was like him. Quietness and value. The description applied to both. Twenty-one dollars they took from her for it, and she hurried home with the eighty-seven cents. She had a habit of saying little silent prayers about the simplest everyday things, and now she whispered, Please, God, make him think I'm still pretty.
Jim, darling, don't look at me that way. I had my hair cut off and sold it because I couldn't have lived through Christmas without giving you a present. It'll grow out again. You won't mind, will you? I just had to do it. My hair grows awfully fast. Say Merry Christmas, Jim, and let's be happy. You don't know what a nice, what a beautiful, nice gift I've got you. You, you've cut off your hair? Cut it off and sold it. Don't you like me just as well, anyhow? I'm me without my hair, aren't I? You say your hair is gone? Sold, I tell you. Sold and gone. It's Christmas Eve, boy. Be good to me, for it went for you. Maybe the hairs of my head were numbered. But nobody can ever count my love for you. Don't make any mistake, Del. About me, I don't think there's anything in the way of a haircut or a shave or a shampoo that can make me like my girl any less. But if you'll unwrap that package, you may see why you had me going a while at first. <gasps> oh no! There lay the combs, the set of combs, side and back, that Della had worshipped for long in the Broadway window. Beautiful combs, pure tortoise shell, with jeweled rims, just the shade to wear, and the beautifully vanished hair. They were expensive combs, she knew, and her heart had simply craved and yearned over them without the least hope of possession. And now they were hers, but the tresses that should have adorned them were gone. But she hugged them to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and smile and say, My hair grows so fast, Jim! Ooh, ooh! Isn't it dandy, Jim? I hunted all over town to find it. You'll have to look at the time a hundred times a day now. Give me your watch. I want to see how it looks on it. Del, let's put our Christmas presents away and keep them a while. They're too nice to just use a present. I sold the watch to get the money to buy your combs. And now suppose you put the chops on. The Magi, as you know, were wise men. Wonderfully wise men. Who brought gifts to the babe in the manger. They invented the art of giving Christmas presents. Being wise, their gifts were no doubt wise ones, possibly bearing the privilege of exchange in case of duplication. And here I have lamely related to you the uneventful chronicle of two foolish children in a flat, who most unwisely sacrificed for each other the greatest treasures of their house. But in a last word to the wise of these days, let it be said that of all who give gifts, these two were the wisest. Of all who give and receive gifts, such as they are the wisest, everywhere they are the wisest. They are the Mesia. I don't know what that word means, so I'm just going to cut it out. Boom. Boom. Safety is number one pro- Aw, oh, crap. My nook turned off. Look at this dude. I don't know who this guy is. Oh, wait, that's a woman. <laughs> Dang it, phone. Why you gotta be this way? At least I didn't have my ringer on. That would've been funny. Uh, I'll turn my ringer on. Aw, oh, damn. Okay, time to look up the pronunciation of magic. <laughs> But she hugged him to her bosom, and at length she was able to look up with dim eyes and smile and say, Ah, oh, crap. This <laughs> look went into sleep mode. That's not in the story. Oh, that's what it looks like. Cool. This is what the, the, the thing looks like. Yeah, I got that wrong. Maybe. It don't matter. All right. Now I can move on to Della's voice. <clears throat> oh, by the way, I love Legos.